to the final talk of the Contemplative Science Center uh, speaker series, co-sponsored by the Virginia Center for the Study of Religion, the uh, Program in Medieval Studies, and the Center for Russian and Eastern European and Eurasian Studies. My name is uh, Ahmed Rahim. I'm an assistant professor of Islamic Studies in the Department of Religious Studies, and also the current director of the Program in Medieval Studies. It's a great pleasure today, uh, along with my colleague, Professor David Germano, who's the director of CSC, to introduce our speaker, Alexander Nish, who is professor of Islamic studies in the Department of Near Eastern Studies at the University of Michigan and principal investigator of a research project on Islamic studies at the University of St. Petersburg, uh, at the University of St. Petersburg's, at St. Petersburg State University in Excuse Russia. Me. There's no amplification. Louder? Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, he specializes in the history and development of Islamic mysticism, or Sufism, covering the medieval period well into the modern. More broadly, he addresses Islamic intellectual history and religious history, including Quranic studies, the history of Muslim theological, philosophical, and juridical thought, and uh, Islamic and Islamist movements, an important distinction to be drawn in comparative perspective. Professor Knish has served as section editor of Sufism for the editorial board of Brill's third Encyclopedia of Islam, uh, and is the executive director of the Encyclopedia of Islamic Mysticism and the handbook series of Sufi studies, also published by Brill in Leiden. Professor Knish, his numerous and expansive publications are too numerous to list here, but they include the following. Ibn al-Arabi in the later Islamic tradition, the making of a polemical image in medieval Islam published by Sunni in 1998. Islamic mysticism, a short history published by Brill in 2000, which in effect really is a useful handbook on that tradition and I highly recommend it to students of Sufism, nay to all students. Uh, and uh, uh, Qureshi's Epistle on Sufism, an annotated translation published by Ithaca Press in 2007. And soon to be published in October is very much anticipated Sufism, a new history of Islamic mysticism. Today, uh, uh, Professor Kanish will be addressing uh, 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 the question of Quranic exegesis and mystical experience, Sufis in the Quran, the title of his talk, Please join me in warmly, very warmly welcoming Professor Kanish to the University of Virginia. Uh, many thanks, Professor Rahim, <clears throat> for inviting me. Uh, um, I also would like to thank the University of Virginia for inviting me to give a talk, actually two talks, the other one will be later. Uh, tomorrow at one o'clock, and um, uh, I am pleased to to have visited such a wonderful uh, environment, such a green environment, especially coming from up north from Michigan, uh, which is still cold. We are probably two or three weeks behind you in terms of spring, so um, I am really delighted and uh, lucky to be here, uh, and uh, I probably sorely. Um, envied by my students when I mentioned that I'm coming to University of Virginia, they issued a, a deep sigh of uh, envy. <laughs> so, um, as you could, could hear from Professor Rahim's presentation, not, nothing Sufi is alien to me. I've, I've studied it for quite a while um, and I enjoy studying it. I love this uh, um, trend or school or movement uh, or stream in Islam um, because it is quite distinct and very rich in ideas, uh, in uh, practical implications and also in institutional history and uh, architectural history because there are many Sufi shrines across the world which are marvels of world architecture. So. Um, Today I'll focus on how Sufis approached Quran and how they used the Quran to achieve certain states of uh, consciousness. 
but I can answer any questions related to Sufism as long as uh, I, I know the answers. Uh, uh, even if I don't, I'll try to improvise. Um, so um, I begin with, uh, uh, by, showing, by saying a few words about what Islamic mysticism is. I know that some of you uh, might already, oh, okay. for some reason it's not moving. Uh, many of you probably know what Sufism is, but uh, this is a very short, um, bare bones definition. Uh, Sufism uh, uh, is usually derived from the Arabic word tasawwuf, which means to put on a woolen a garment. Um, and uh, you, you, you all heard about hair shirts, right? So Sufis were hair shirts wearers because Wool is very harsh on your body, and um, it's unpleasant uh, when soaked. Um, a, a bunch of Sufis would smell like goats, probably. Um, be, uh, therefore, uh, it, it was a sign of humility, a, an expression of humility and poverty. Poverty both physical or material, and uh, spiritual. Poverty uh, means uh, you are poor in God. You are always, uh, you do not have enough of your contact, encounter with God, and you seek a, to approach God by all means available to human beings. So, as you could see, it emerged uh, in, during the first uh, Islamic century, and uh, uh, I I have many other etymologies for Sufism, which I could recount, but I don't have the time. So uh, Sufis uh, prefer to derive their uh, name, the name of their movement from the word Safa, which means uh, purity, purity of uh, worship of God, uh, purity of uh, thoughts, mm, the absence of back thoughts, uh, and uh, second guessing of their uh, motives and so forth. Uh, then there are other etymologies. If you ask me, I'll be happy to, uh, to, to, con to convey to you the panoply of uh, different <coughs> etymologies. But the preferred etymology is the wool because it symbolized humility and um, abandonment of the d delights of this world. Um, as Sufi monks, uh, as Christian monks and anchorites, sometimes Sufis are called uh, Muslim monks. Uh, Muslims, ascetic mystics, engage in self-control, meditation, and special body regimens, so called uh, the self-imposed strictures, aimed at achieving equanimity uh, and, con and uh, special states of consciousness and perception of the world. For the lay people and ordinary believers, at least in the Middle Ages, uh, and even in the modern time, uh, both the monks and the Sufis uh, embody a way to God, and eventually a promise of salvation. There are not too many uh, uh, slides, so I hope I can do without the clicker. Uh, uh, First of all, when I started to study Sufism, I discovered that it is extremely diverse internally, and that's what uh, captured my attention from the very beginning. Um, we find uh, a wide variety of lifestyle and uh, uh, external behavior uh, that fall under the categories of tasawwuf or Sufism. Uh, we find asocial recluses, similar to the Desert Fathers in Christianity, St. Anthony comes to mind. Those who escaped the world, hid from people on the, uh, uh, in the caves, uh, in the mountains, on mountain tops, on the seashores, trying not to focus on God, single-mindedly uh, and uh, abandoning society, which was a distraction from the earth of concentration on, on God. There were also, we find in the same uh, uh, category, knights of the prayer niche, as they are called, Fursan al-Mihrab in Arabic, as they are called, uh, 
or oh, warrior monks, uh, familiar to you from the Crusades, the Templars and uh, uh, the Hospitallers, uh, the uh, Knights of the Orders of St. John uh, of Jerusalem. So uh, these individuals uh, actively sought martyrdom in the battlefield, fighting against the Greeks, the Byzantiums, Bi 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 um, in what today is Turkey, southern <coughs> Turkey, and also on the other borderlands of Islam, uh, especially in uh, Africa, when they were advancing the borders of Islam, um, fighting against the local Berber African population. They also were uh, active in uh, the east, in the areas inhabited by pagan Turks, whom they sought to convert to Islam. Sometimes Muslim uh, mystics and ascetics are described as the hoplites of Islam, that is, the foot soldiers of Islam, uh, the, who advance the borders of Islam militarily, but also try to convert local population by their example. Uh, they were, as one Christian chronicle, Byzantine Greek chronicle said, they were warriors during the day and monks during the night. They prayed uh, in, in their uh, 45 uh, outposts uh, during the night engaged in uh, fasting, supererogatory, that is additional fasting, non-required fasting, and uh, became formidable force, fighting force against the, uh, the Greeks in particular. Uh, then there are also individuals who were not interested in warfare at all. They were love-lorn proponents of pure disinterest desire for God. And here, the Arabia al um of Basra, uh, a female mystic, uh, the greatest actually female mystic in the history of the Muslim world. Uh, she lived in Basra and uh, preached a, a disinterested love of God. What it means is that she was loving God not for the sake of the rewards that God promised to the uh, righteous, nor, for, nor out of fear of the, the hellfire, which was, of course, uh, threat, uh, with which God threatened the sinners and the deviators from the Sharia, from the Islamic law. So she said, no, I don't uh, worship and love God because of uh, these two concerns. Rather, I, uh, my love is absolutely pure. And to the extent that uh, this love leaves no place in my heart, even for the Prophet Muhammad. That was already a kind of heretical, controversial statement. So God is, uh, uh, preoccupies her, attracts her to such an extent that she even loses the sight of his prophet. Um, there are many stories, very beautiful stories about her. Uh, Margaret Smith, a British uh, scholar, wrote a whole book about her. Uh, and there are recent books and there are films in Egypt made about her. And the, the famous... Uh, Square, uh, which was the site of the uh, rebellion of the Muslim Brothers, is uh, named after her. It's, called, it's pronounced Rabba, which is in, incorrect. Rabia means the fourth. She was the fourth female uh, member of the household, and that's what it means. Uh, and then the, we also find in the same category the ecstatic, ecstatic drunken, intoxicated Sufis, uh, such as Al-Hallaj, who was executed in 922, for preaching, uh, again, uh, union with God, which was perceived by many either as a karmati, Ismaili doctrine that he could unify the nasut, the human nature, and lahud, the divine nature in himself. Um, and uh, al-Hallaj, uh, who was <coughs> crucified, um, cruelly executed for his uh, heretical statements, uh, was caught up also in the court intrigue, which um, I do not want to, to uh, elaborate on. It's too long. It will take too long. But anyway, he exemplifies this mystical behavior, which can, could be socially irresponsible. Such individuals could become rebel rousers because they say, I am, I am God, follow me, I, or I am, I am a manifestation of God, follow me. And uh, then finally, we see sober, responsible teachers teaching uh, in private, very dangerous ideas, but in public, saying we obey the Sharia, we obey the external law, and follow it to the letter. 
And then there were pious admonishers of rulers and, mass, uh, and masses, preachers and theorists or collectors of Sufi lore. Um, however, all these diverse individuals with different agendas, different aspirations, different temperaments, they uh, were united by uh, the commonality of purpose. God is their soul, uh, they, they considered God to be the soul worthy object of worship and affection. Uh, and they also perceived very acutely the immediate presence of God in the midst, in the midst of human societies in the world. So uh, moving on, the two the individuals portrayed here are Indian fakirs, uh, who, which means poor. The, uh, one of the words that uh, Sufis preferred to call themselves. They wanted to be seen as the poor. In the, in the two senses that I described earlier, poor in God and poor materially, physically. So there are many, uh, if you read a Sufi uh, tra treatise, tractate, um, a Sufi uh, memoir, you, there is a, 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 a theme, a constant theme that uh, our experience, mystical, ascetic experience, is, uh, cannot be conveyed. It's ineffable. It cannot be conveyed to other people. Yet, they have produced an enormous, enormous number of books which keep me busy and my colleagues too. So contrary to their <laughs> saying that they are, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, mystical experience can, of God cannot be systematized, the systematization takes place. Uh, the tradition discovers its heroes. It writes biographies of these heroes. And these biographies becomes like a model, role models for others to follow. So this is a biogra biographical literature. Then there are descriptions of the language, what uh, we mean when we say hal, which means a spiritual state. And then there are definitions. So. Uh, in other words, this human, irresistible human desire to rationalize, to compartmentalize, I'm sorry, I'm tongue-tied today, um, that created a, 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 a prolific literature uh, that, uh, that uh, became a, a marker of identity. Sufis with their literature, had their literature, had their role models, had their terminology, had their language. Their, their language was incomprehensible to outsiders who haven't read the, the books or who haven't uh, sat at the feet of the teacher who would teach them. So they gradually became a distinct stream within Islam. Again, again uh, Sufis say, no, we are all Muslims. But in fact, they created a school. And uh, I, in the rest of the talk, I'll try to demonstrate uh, how they did that by uh, approaching the Quran. The Quran. Their reading, understanding of the Quran also set them apart from the rest of the Muslims uh, because it was so unique, so unusual, and sometimes very controversial. So they called their uh, science ilma hadith taifa, so the, uh, the knowledge of this community. I don't want to use the term sect because it uh, has Christian connotations as if someone declared them to be kind of outside the pale of orthodoxy. Um, but what is important for us, and hang on to this, is the last, uh, this last point. Sufi masters, sheikhs, peers, peer in, uh, in Persian means father, more or less spiritual father. Sheikh means elder. And Murshid is the one who leads uh, on the straight path. Uh, they started to claim a superior intuitive revelatory knowledge on Gnosis, Ma'arifa in Arabic, of God. And uh, they also claimed that they know the underlying message of the dispensation of the Quran, which is concealed from uh, ordinary human beings, even ordinary believers. And so we, we have a, a, a specific um, Sufi exegesis, which is the subject of my today's presentation. The tafsir is the ordinary, historical, uh, literary, uh, legal interpretations of, of, the, of the Quran. But there gradually emerged a second mode of exploring the Quran, which is called ta'awil. 
the terminology is fuzzy. Sometimes uh, people who wrote very uh, philological, historical commentaries use the word tawil to describe their uh, works. For instance, Al-Tabari used it, uh, who was the greatest uh, um, ex exoteric in, uh, interpreter of the Quran. Nevertheless, uh, gradually this term tawil became unique to the way in which the Muslims explored the Quran, understood it, and appropriated it um, into their, integrated it into their spiritual life. Uh, and here I also uh, would like to draw your attention that various Shiite groups, uh, the 12 are Shiites, the, who believe in the existence of the 12th is the Imam, of whom the 12th is now in hiding. Uh, then there are Ismailis and Zaydis. Uh, they, also, they insist that their leaders, the Imams, are in possession of the privileged knowledge of the revelation. Uh, they called it the botan. Botan is stomach or tummy, if you wish. Uh, so something that is hidden. Uh, and so the imams claim that their, uh, the, the, the followers of the Shi imams claim that their leaders have access to that secret, uh, hidden uh, stomach knowledge, if you wish, uh, of the revelation. Um, and Sufi made the same claim. They also said our leaders, who are not descend descendants of Ali and Fatima, they, uh, in order to be imam, you had to belong to a certain lineage, within the prophetic family of Ali and Fatima uh, line, uh, lineage. And uh, in other words, you, you inherited this knowledge, this insight into the Quran from uh, the prophet and uh, his uh, uh, direct descendants. Sufis said, no, everyone could, uh, could become uh, a, a, per a possessor of this uh, supernatural insight. Uh, as long as uh, he or she cleanses himself or herself from the mundane concerns, animal life uh, drives of the base soul, and, the, uh, and that eventually leads you to the insight into the, Quran, uh, into the real hidden meaning of the Quranic text. So my next uh, slide asks whether Sufi Tawil, whether Sufi exegesis is a Sunni response to the Shi Tawil. Uh, very often the, the competition between Sunnism and Shiism for, uh, in, in the field of truth claims is forgotten. But I think uh, the, the Su Sufis, Sufi, the majority of Sufis uh, who are Sunni, of course there are Shi Sufis, but uh, in Shi Islam the position of uh, ascetic mystics is controversial because their claims run against the main doctrine uh, of Shiism that only the Imams can achieve certain uh, knowledge that is unaccessible to others. So it's a genealogical privilege. Yeah. Does it make sense? Uh, whereas Sunni said that every, uh, every person, every man in the street could acquire it uh, with, with, with God's help. In fact, uh, even very unlikely individuals could eventually acquire insight because they're just, uh, del uh, I would say, randomly chosen by God for the revelation. Uh, there are many stories about that. So that, uh, therefore, um, uh, in, under, in, in Shi territories, Sufis were looked down upon as uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, People who uh, arrogated the privileges of the imam for uh, uh, of the privilege of uh, the imam to know the uh, hidden aspects of the Quran. Does it make sense? That's why uh, Shiism had a very complicated relations with Su 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 Sufism. In Sunni Islam, the Shiites uh, become uh, uh, in, in Sunni Islam, Sufis uh, uh, basically make claims that are similar to the claims made by the Shi Imam. Uh, what is also interesting that both Sunnis and Shi claim that this uh, idea of the hidden privileged knowledge originated in the uh, Shi circle. Jafar al-Sadiq was the sixth Imam of the, of the Shia 
who uh, had a large number of followers and who was one of the first, according to the Islamic tradition, to uh, try to, uh, um, to plumb the depth of the Quranic revelation. And he came up with the theory of several meanings of the Quran, which are, are very, uh, very uh, uh, similar to the patristic tradition of four of, or five or six uh, levels of, uh, uh, in, in, uh, of meanings in, uh, in the Judeo-Christian scriptures. I, will, I just don't have the time to discuss them all. But so there are, uh, in other words, uh, points of uh, intersection between Sufi claims and Shi claims from the very beginning, and they're associated uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the figure of the Jafar al-Sadiq, the sixth imam. It's, uh, th what I say is it's controversial. Of course, when uh, Sunnis hear this, uh, they say, uh, Sunni, Shi, uh, Sufis hear this, they, they deny that uh, their tradition emerged as a, at, at least par in part as a response to the Shi claims to privileged knowledge. So moving on, both uh, Shi Sufis and Shis tend to see the rest of Muslims as literalists and even simpletons concerned with, with husks rather than the kernel of the divine law uh, and the divine word. Another point of meeting or rencontre, meeting between uh, Shis and uh, Sufis is uh, that both claim, uh, the Shi Imams and the Su uh, Sufi uh, Sheikhs claim the status of the friends of God or saints, awliya. So in, in both traditions, the sainthood is associated uh, with individuals who have insight into the real meaning of the Quran. Again, in Shia tradition, the, these are the Imams. In the Sufi tradition, it uh, divinely chosen individuals who do not necessarily have the, uh, the genealogical uh, privileges of the Imams. Right? The term is, that is used uh, is taken, uh, the friends of God or saints, uh, very often translated into European languages as saints, but uh, there are considerable differences. Uh, therefore, the word saints uh, is criticized when applied to Sufi uh, friends of God um, because there is no canonization process, at least, uh, to, to, be, if, if, to, to put it uh, uh, briefly. Um, so, in both cases, Sufi saints and Shi Imams serve as unerring guides uh, for their respective uh, communities. Uh, and uh, what is also important, uh, they, uh, both the Shi Imams and the uh, friends of God in Sunnism, they um, keep the revelation alive. Uh, thereby serving as the kind of surrogate prophets for, the, uh, for their communities. They are leaders uh, at the time when the revelation is no longer available. It ceased, it stopped with the prophet, but uh, in order to in reinvigorate it constantly, you need individuals who uh, breathe new life into uh, the prophecy. Therefore, prophecy continues, as one of the uh, uh, European scholars call it. Um, how do Sufis justify their claims uh, to, to the knowledge? Of course, if you just say, you know, I know something others do not know, you will be left out of court. Uh, you have to find a, a scriptural precedent, and yes, there is a scriptural precedent in the Quran, an encounter between uh, Moses, Moses, Musa, and the green man, Al-Khadir. Here you can see Musa, that uh, happens in Egypt, where he, his uh, staff turns into a dragon that eats the uh, uh, snakes uh, produced by the sorcerers of Egypt uh, at uh, Pharaoh's behest. Uh, but uh, in, in one of the uh, Quranic surahs called the cave, you can read it for yourself, we find uh, the appearance of Moses uh, alongside a, a strange, uh, mysterious figure 
who was later identified by the Islamic uh, script, uh, I mean, uh, exegetical tradition as Al-Khadr, the green man, or Khidr, or Elias, associated with Elias. Uh, it, uh, uh, it bears a striking resemblance, this Quranic story. What happens is Moses uh, wa wants, this, uh, wants to join this mysterious individual. Um, the mysterious individual, who was later identified as Al-Khadr, or the green man, tells him, no, no, you will not be able to bear what you, bear what you will see uh, from me. Uh, but uh, Moses is very persistent, like a kid. <laughs> Uh, grabs him by the, uh, by, the, by the sleeve and says, no, please allow me. And then, indeed, very unusual things happen. Uh, contrary to all morals, uh, they, uh, in one case, uh, uh, the, uh, the ship is sunk. Uh, in, other, in another, Khadr kills a boy. Uh, and then, uh, when they are starving, he uh, restores a wall in, in the city. Uh, without asking for compensation. So this extra uh, eventually uh, Moses uh, pleads to explain to him how uh, uh, a man of God could engage in such outrageous actions. And uh, the uh, green man, he's called in the Quran simply a slave of God uh, or servant of God, he explains to him why he did these outrageous things, and then uh, everything becomes clear, but it's too late. Moses, uh, uh, the uh, mysterious man becomes disappointed in Moses and says, go away. Uh, so this is departure between you and me. And uh, uh, the story rep replicates uh, the famous uh, Jewish story of Elijah and Rabbi Joshua ben Levi, all very, very similar stories. If you read them, you, you can find them, of course, in Wikipedia. Uh, and check them out. You will see that there are many uh, parallels. What, what the story says is that even the prophet uh, who, who, is, who is obsessed with the external, externals of things can sometimes miss the point, uh, the point uh, that God made by a certain event or certain individual. In other words, uh, in, uh, the, uh, in, in reality, there is much more than meets the eye. And even the prophet, exoteric prophet, the prophet who's committed to the fulfillment of external commands uh, of God, he can uh, be uh, wrong, misled. Uh, whereas a person with the insight uh, can perceive the real implications of the divine providence in various things. Does it make sense? So moving on. Uh, so that's how this, the, the presence of the insight uh, in certain individuals and their ability to interpret the Quran would be explained uh, uh, rationally. So we started, I'm try, looking at the time, I'll try, uh, I'll try to... Uh, not to exhaust you too much, <laughs> because concentrating uh, on uh, many names, uh, different names, uh, exotic names, on uh, many plot lines, <laughs> it, it may be tiresome, uh, I understand. So uh, I hope you will persevere for another 15 minutes, maybe, uh, and then uh, we'll uh, switch to questions and answers, uh, which will be more lively, I hope. Um, so, uh, how the Quran is used by the Sufis? I explained to you that uh, the, uh, uh, the, the Quran uh, contains some references to the hidden knowledge available only to the elect few who can understand uh, the Quranic, uh, uh, the underlying meaning of the Quran. But uh, the Quran can also uh, be used by as Muslim ascetics and mystics as a means of reaching a higher level of uh, God awareness. Uh, again, feeling the uh, immediate uh, presence of God in their midst. Uh, they use the Quran, of course, which says God is closer to human beings than his, their jugular vein. Uh, and therefore, he is actually invisibly present not only in the outside world, but in everyone. 
And that's what Al-Hallaj, the guy who was executed in 922 in Baghdad in a very cruel fashion, that's what he claimed. That a person can become a walking, talking manifestation of God. He also said eating and drinking, uh, manifestation of God. And that for that he was put to a cruel death because that reminded too closely the Christian doctrine of incarnation. Um, so uh, the second... Uh, uh, the second uh, function of the Quran is to help uh, its followers, especially mystically oriented individuals, to recapture the rapture of the Prophet. You read the Quran in order to return to the state of mind of the Prophet at the time of the revelation. So uh, the Quran is internalized and allows you to, as I say, relive the experience or recapture the rapture of the Prophet. Uh, the raptures of the Prophet or his uh, ecstatic states uh, when he received the revelation are described in great detail in Islamic literature, in the biography of the Prophet. Uh, they, he had ocular vision, audio visions, and uh, various other types of visions. Uh, so, by reading the Quran, you try to return to that state in which the Prophet... Of course, you can never reach the same uh, perfection as the Prophet, but at least you get a glimpse of what might happen if you work yourself in a certain state of mind through the recitation of the Quran. So, I cite... Uh, uh, the, the other uh, group of verses has to do with Moses, who, uh, whose uh, uh, presence in the Quran is just overwhelming. He is more, he's mentioned more than any other prophet uh, in the Quran. So uh, the, B Moses encounters God uh, in, on, on Mount Sinai, and he con converses with God, uh, who speaks to him from the burning bush. Uh, These uh, episodes are mentioned in the Quran, and... Uh, these passages are used by Sufis to assert and justify the possibility of direct interaction or dialogue between God and his devout and faithful seeker, Murid. So the Quran can also uh, serve uh, as a means of collective uh, worship of God. In the uh, practice that is called dhikr, but there are many other words, hadra, hadra, uh, dhikr, uh, hadra means uh, basically uh, assembly. Dhikr means recollection of God. Uh, <clears throat> when people reciting the, the Quran sometimes fall into trance, uh, they experience changed states of consciousness uh, uh, in the circle of like-minded individual. But they can also... Uh, read the Quran uh, constantly, recite it while walking and working, uh, and it becomes internalized to the extent that uh, certain individuals becomes walking Qurans. Uh, the same, by the way, uh, uh, status of certain uh, of the Imams was claimed by the Shias, that they were the walking Qurans. Again, a parallel between Sunni Sufism and Shiism, uh, the Imamology of Shiism. What the Quran is also contains, uh, again, to help uh, um, grist to the mill of the Sufis is that he says that, uh, that it con text contains uh, clear verses and ambiguous. The clear verses are available and understandable by everyone, but the uh, so-called ambiguous, uh, the Quran says, are available only to those firmly rooted in knowledge. So, of course, the Shiites claim that the Imams were the firmly rooted in knowledge. The, Shi uh, the Sufis uh, countered by saying, no, this is our Sufi uh, masters, teachers, who uh, can understand the ambiguous, which are not available to others. Again, uh, the, the Sufi exegete said that uh, these first group of verses, the clear verses, are uh, a clear expression, ibara as opposed to allegoric allusion or hint, ishara. So they, the Sufis are the people of the ishara, of the allusion, whereas the majority of human beings are the people of the externals uh, of the Quran. In, and I already talked about the legal commentary. 
philological, historical, did didactic uh, commentary as opposed to allegorically, allegorical uh, uh, reading of the Quran, which is called Tawil, to, to dis distinguish it from Tafsir. Um, Another important uh, uh, conclusion at which Sufis have derived is that the more pious you are, the more insight you get into the Quran. If you purify your soul, make it uh, completely focused on God and oblivious of the surroundings, whether they are favorable or unfavorable, you gain a greater insight than a wordling who just reads the Quran mechanically and cannot see uh, beyond its external meanings. So uh, a person, for instance, a merchant who constantly, while reciting the Quran, calculating his income would be just like a blind person who cannot see uh, beyond the letter. The, the world beyond the letter could only be perceived by a person who is uh, free from any mundane uh, concerns from the passions of his lower soul or her lower soul, uh, sexual appetites, food, water, uh, if you are thirsty, and so forth. Then you enter into a special state of mind when you begin to uh, understand the divine text differently and uh, more profoundly. You begin to extract the meanings that are hidden from others. Uh, I will, uh, on the, uh, this uh, uh, idea of extracting uh, deeper meanings of the Quran is called istinbat. It was used, and I'll show this in a later slide, uh, it was used already in early Sufi literature in the 10th century as a special way of approaching the Quran. Uh, what is being extracted and how? Uh, Sufi exegetical psychology. So you listen to the Quran while you are walking in the street, and you, 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 something, you hear a phrase, one individual phrase, or even a word from the Quran that somehow resonates with your current state of mind and uh, psyche. And they enter into resonance. Some people uh, fainted. Others died this, when this happened. So there can be an interface or resonance between one's personal experience of the moment and the, the particular Quranic keynote. Professor Rahim's teacher, Gerhard Bervering, uh, also mulled over this uh, issue, and he said, uh, that we're dealing in such cases with a product of the encounter between a Quranic keynote and the exe exegete's world of ideas. Um, but uh, if uh, the Quran was initially read uh, without this uh, very rich cultural baggage that was available to Muslims in the Mediterranean, Gradually, these ideas, uh, Mediterranean ideas, uh, derived from the ancient Greeks, ancient Persians, uh, uh, Christians, uh, Syriac Christians, uh, they made their way into their intellectual universe. And then their intellectual universe began to resonate differently. It became more impregnated with these teachings that were originally actually alien to the Islamic uh, ideas, or at least uh, somehow not well integrated. And that that's gives birth to the emergence of what is uh, uh, one author, Gavin Flood, calls the cosmological psychology. Uh, when you begin to read the Quran and discover in it meanings, that uh, resonate less with the Muslim tradition than with the uh, uh, pre-Islamic tradition of Neoplatonism, Platonism, uh, Gnosticism, uh, Hermeticism, and so forth. So that's how uh, the, uh, the pristine Sufi experience acquired, uh, I would say, cosmological 
and nociological aspects of epistemological aspects. And these uh, ideas uh, are found, uh, these ideas were, uh, are in evidence in the works of Ibn al-Arabi, whom I studied. Uh, so, uh, but what is remarkable today uh, that these ideas are not dead. This universes of meaning, this uh, Sufi cosmological psychology is still very much alive and uh, I attended several preachings of the Sufi uh, Sheikh Hisham Qabbani of the Najbandiya Haqqani Rabbaniya Tariqa based in Fenton, Michigan. There are many uh, uh, followers, both uh, converts and uh, Muslim, uh, Muslim born followers. Uh, who uh, admire this sheikh, and he uses the same cosmological, uh, cosmological psychology that had developed in the 14th, 13th centuries in Islam, when uh, finally the ideas of uh, ancient Greeks, uh, Gnostics, and uh, her Hermeticists were integrated into the Muslim intellectual universe. And, and it affected the ways in which the Quran was read. So in Ibn Arabi, we find this, uh, uh, what uh, Umberto Eco, who recently died, unfortunately, the great uh, uh, scholar of medieval Europe, European culture from Italy, called uh, hermeneutical drift or unlimited semiosis. It's a, when you, uh, 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 when um, God is found in, uh, in everything, he manifests, or it manifests, his divine absolute manifests itself in everything and found in everything, and everything is a sort of manifestation of God, a divine enigma which you have to decide. So then the, uh, of, in uh, Ibn Arabi's reading of the Quran, it's a constant like stream of consciousness, I would say stream of association. One association brings in its train another, uh, and that association suddenly, very whimsically, uh, jumps to some other aspect of human experience or uh, disciplinary field like theology and uh, uh, without uh, end. This, by the way, is the Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Hisham Al-Qabbani al Naqshbandi in his Fenton uh, Lodge uh, in uh, Upper Peninsula uh, in Michigan. Uh, it's Middle Peninsula, I would say. Uh, he uh, uh, navigates this sea of meanings and invites people to follow. So he's like a captain of a ship who says, you want to discover the mysteries of the Quran. You want to discover the mysteries of uh, uh, human existence, the mysteries of the creation of the world. I am your captain. Follow me. And uh, he navigates here. He's, of course, playing with his uh, uh, smartphone, but uh, he's like a navigator. Uh, and uh, his uh, internet presence is very robust. You will find him. You know. Uh, everywhere, you can even uh, uh, pledge allegiance to him electronically. In other words, what, what these individuals do today is they're drawing on that rich tradition of exegesis that had been created by generation of very creative human beings uh, who constructed a whole separate universe of meaning which they say is truer to reality than the ones that we experience. And they invite us to enter it, and they promise us uh, that we will discover these mysteries with them. And this is, I think, my final. You, you couldn't believe it, but it is, it's the final one. Um, I, I skipped some important uh, points because I see that your eyes are getting glassy. And, uh, so, but uh, let's go to the, some conclusions. 
you can imagine that this uh, interpretations of the Quran, which Ibn Arabi, for instance, says that uh, Moses was basically a fool uh, when he came down with the tablets and saw that uh, his uh, uh, followers uh, with his brother Aaron were worshiping the uh, golden calf. He broke the tablets and uh, cursed him and grabbed his uh, Aaron by his beard. Uh, and the Quran, uh, and uh, Ibn Arabi says, it's like the story of Moses and Khadr. Yeah? Uh, because uh, what Moses didn't see, uh, and he said he should have looked in the tablets before doing what he did, uh, was that God can be worshipped in everything, including the golden calf. So, uh, and uh, Moses foolishly kind of uh, followed in the usual, this esoteric, external pattern without real, he should have looked into the tablets, he said, before attacking Aaron and his uh, followers uh, and uh, destroying the golden calf. So, and there are many other story, uh, interpretations. Can you imagine this interpretation, how they would sit with the, uh, uh, individuals who do not believe that there are special people able to discover the hidden meanings behind the external. They infuriated them. And today's fundamentalists, they are still infuriated. Some had a uh, nearly heart attack. I, I, I saw him when they heard uh, stories. Uh, uh, one, one Sufi, contemporary Sufi, who will remain unnamed, was interpreting the Quran along the lines I just described. And he was in the audience. He really almost fainted uh, from the, such sacrilege. So, but uh, if we step back, why this Sufi exegesis is dangerous for the ex people of the externals, of the exoterices? Because it uh, presents a challenge to their claim to know the Quran. And second, more importantly, it relativizes the meaning of the Quran. It means relativizing, you can read anything that li lies in your soul into the Quran. Uh, and the Quran becomes like a, 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 a free for all. Yeah, everyone can interpret it based on his uh, or her state, uh, intellectual state and psychological state of the moment. And that destabilizes the tradition. So my, maybe fun, fundamentalists, they're not like pig-headed, stick-in-the-mud individuals, uh, dead set against the inter But they see the destabilization. And they are afraid that weak minds might interpret the Quran in a wrong cue, and then the whole texture of the, that keeps together the Islamic community will unravel. Therefore, the constant fight against, which began, had already begun in, in the Middle Ages and continues today, is uh, to, re, to uh, minimize or remove at all, uh, altogether this destabilizing effect of the allegorical uh, and mystical interpretations of the Quran. So they want to, these flights of exegetical uh, fantasy to be res restrained, to be, uh, uh, again, uh, uh, prevented and tamed. So on this note of the lack of seeing eye to eye between the esotericist and exotericist, I will stop. Uh, I also may suggest that the majority of people in this audience will also have uh, special uh, approaches to the, any scripture and may even fall into these two camps of esotericist, exotericist, or maybe somewhere in between. Thank you. So, Professor Rahim uh, kindly agreed me to field your questions. So. May I begin with the first? Uh, yes. Yeah? Uh, so, I wonder if you could, the Quran has its own notion of psychology, right? The makeup of the soul and, the, uh, 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 and its faculties, etc. How is that psychology of the Quran, if you would explain it to us, uh, appropriated by the Sufis? I mean, because some would say that the Quran, in many ways, 
uh, it has a kind of mystical sort of uh, apparatus for how the soul works. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, how is that appropriated by the Sufis? Uh, uh, yeah. Of course, the psychological uh, aspects of the Quran were of particular interest to Sufi interpreters. Um, the most dramatic examples is the Quran's mentions of the three states of human soul. The recalcitrant uh, soul uh, that uh, uh, rejects divine command. The soul is called nafs, N-A-F-S, uh, which is anima, that is the uh, <laughs> appetitive uh, animal-like soul that resists the commands of God. It has to be tamed. It's called uh, the, uh, the soul that commands evil in the Quran. So this is Quranic psychology, definitely there are, uh, and of course the Sufis are attracted to this idea. Then it can be transformed through the, that self-imposed strictures, uh, self-control into, um, into eventually a soul at peace, al uh, um and uh, that's, that's the psychology. They say the Quran commands us to tame our souls, to work on them, uh, to, to restrain them. The soul is of, often described uh, in uh, animal-like term, this restive soul, either as a restive donkey that got stuck on the bridge or as a black dog or whatever. Uh, you have to, to work on it. Uh, so, and then, um, then it becomes the soul at peace, tranquil soul uh, that uh, is indifferent to it, the outside conditions or the conditions of the body in which it resides. Uh, and uh, then Al-Ghazali comes and says, basically it's the chemistry, yeah, alchemy. Uh, you transform one, uh, the, the, the role of the teacher is to transform this originally restive animal-like soul into this noble, uh, uh, acquiesced soul, uh, soul at peace with itself and the world. And the, the chemistry is, uh, the, the, al the philosopher's stone that does this is the leadership or the guidance of your teacher. Uh, so, yeah, so the, the, the Quran is rich in these meanings. There are different types of truth. Uh, Ayn al yeah, uh, the different types of truth mentioned and uh, different types of insights. So yes, uh, the Quran offers, uh, uh, I think, very fertile uh, ideas for development into a fully-fledged psychology. But the first psychology which developed was the psychology of the back thoughts. Uh, uh, Kafka said that human beings are just a, a, a red hole of back thoughts. So, so, the hot water. so that's why uh, you, you have to work on your back thoughts to try to expel them uh, or uh, minimize their influence. Yes. Um, thank you so much for your talk. I'm, I'm an anthropologist working on a soul figure, so I don't necessarily have a immense background in theology or these issues. But uh, so the group I'm working with is upper class. Uh, the group. It's a Sufi group, it's a very upper class uh, Fai tradition who is following in Narati and Rumi uh, in Turkey. And uh, they're kind of attacked not only by the fundamentalists, but also by other Sufi groups. One is that they're female shaykhah, they need both men and women. I mean, it's enough for reason, but, but what I'm figuring out is that you know, the, the other most mainstream Sufi groups in Turkey are what is called like neo Sufi. Yes. Like very orthodox, very kind of close to all these things that they were mentioning, right? There is no mystical union anymore. It's more like emulation of Prophet Muhammad and Prophet studies. And I'm trying to figure out who is more modern than, like, you know, because they're accusing this group of being too modern, too postmodern, too Western and everything. Whereas it is the Rufaiis who are kind of following this kind of, you know, pre modern Sufi tradition, whereas other mainstream who think they're traditional are more modern. So I'm trying to work out this product by myself, like, what would you like to say about the social figures and what's lost in there? Well, I think you, you, uh, you're probably familiar, you're, uh, no doubt, with the works of Marcia Hermanson. Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah, that she says that there are the traditional types. Uh, when uh, Muslims immigrate to the United States, they bring with them uh, their own tradition almost intact. But they change it under the influence of the, uh, I think, local realities and local exigencies, uh, including, for instance, uh, uh, the rejection of the strict separation between the sexes. Uh, at Fenton, uh, Sheikh Hisham uh, doesn't object to uh, men and women mingling, which would be unthinkable in more traditional. So you should identify several markers which you consider uh, to be modern. I think one of them, the, mm, the, the, the gender relations, uh, is very important as a marker. Then uh, there are Sufi groups that uh, follow uh, that, that uh, embrace Ibn Arabi but do not convert. And you probably know that there are non-Muslim Sufis uh, available, uh, present everywhere, especially, of course, in the Bay Area, uh, <laughs> for obvious reasons, yeah. Uh, so uh, they practice dhikr, but they also uh, perform Buddhist uh, rituals. Uh, but they found in Ibn Arabi, for instance, a manifestation of that perennial wisdom. They are perennialists, tradition, tra traditional, yeah, traditional. Uh, so these are non-denominational Sufis. Uh, then there are uh, individuals who are you know, hybrids, uh, as, as uh, Marcia Hermanson. So you should probably, it's a complex, um, I would say, a research question. You should identify what, you, what markers you would identify as modern, what are uh, definitely pre-modern, and what are transitional. And then maybe it, you will get a handle on this issue, but it's, it's not uh, an easy one. But... Uh, it's like almost Salafization of some Sufi groups. Like, Salafization? Yeah, I mean, it's happening, right? Yes, it takes place, yes. So, uh, this uh, this uh, phenomenon is called at tariqa al muhammadiya uh, and it emerged in uh, Turkey in the 15th century, 16th century, with Birgawi. And uh, the idea that uh, uh, focus on the prophet, not on God, as the, and then the focus on the sheikh. Uh, Salafis also follow their leaders, that is, fundamentalists, follow their leader blindly very often. So there is some affinities between Sufis who completely, who believe in only in their sheikh and nothing else, and also the Salafis who, whom their um, emirs can send into the battle. And uh, so uh, structurally, the, they are, typologically, there are affinities. Uh, but uh, tomorrow I'll talk about the Suf Sufism in the Northern Caucasus. Uh, here and in, in the Sudan also Sufism serve as a surrogate political parties, where obedience is important, where uh, these flights fantasy are not, yeah, because it uh, interferes with the discipline, party discipline. So uh, in, in, in Chechnya today, for instance, these are, uh, uh, the, these uh, Sufi groups act as political parties. So they vote for the candidate whom, uh, the, uh, whom they are told uh, to vote for by the sheikh. Uh, in, uh, in Africa, the same thing, in West Africa, in uh, the followers of Muridiya, they would, they, uh, so Sufi, uh, brother, Sufi brotherhoods transform themselves, they're constant, they mutate. Uh, you, you cannot nail them down. And precisely this uh, malleability, flexibility, makes them so persistent and uh, Sufism is a phenomenon that was buried originally in the 60s. They said Sufism is about to uh, go belly up. There will be no Sufism at all uh, because modernity will overwhelm. But nothing like that happened. It's because Sufis are using their tradition very creatively. They respond uh, very positively to the internet and they use it as a recruitment tool as never before. And that increases their audiences. But yes, there are despiritualized Sufis, but it's one of the, I told, in the beginning, I showed you how many different groups there are. Yes. Uh, the question is generally about mystical experience and sociology. So it, it, uh, we have learned from a variety of mystical teachers and traditions 
that the great claim to be that close to God may produce a very humble person. So uh, the question of Sufism, how does that dynamic work out? The sociology that flows from this total experience, does it shy away from social and economic power, or does it seek to build social and economic power? How is that dynamic? The dynamic, uh, I think, uh, uh, the answer would be the diversity of Sufism. So there are Sufis who are uh, like uh, very active in this world. It's uh, what Weber described, innerworldly asceticism, who uh, want to change the situation in the world for the better through their act actions. In particular, and this uh, is in evidence in Sufi tradition, in the 15th century, for late 14th, 15th century, there appeared Sufi masters in Central Asia who deliberately cultivated friendship with the rulers in order to, uh, um, to institute a reform from, from top. Uh, they also acquired huge uh, land, uh, lands, tracts of land, uh, they had their murids work the land, so uh, they were very mundane. And, and this reminds us, of course, the, of the vicissitudes of monastic orders in Christianity. Uh, they are now, uh, Franciscans are driving Cadillacs, I saw this in Grand Rapids. Uh, they're supposed to be uh, dirt poor, but uh, they, they are not. Uh, so, uh, so they're... Uh, Again, uh, that's why the Weberian model is so uh, influential, because he put his finger on the very important issue of how uh, the originally high-minded uh, ideals uh, and their followers uh, begin to make compromises in order to secure the following, and you have to feed your murids. If you want more murids, you have to feed them better than your rival. So a rivalry competition, it's, uh, that's how human beings act. So, uh, but uh, then reclusive people normally do not have large followers. If they go in, to the desert or to the cave, although St. Anthony did uh, acquire a large follower, but it's against his wish that, uh, that uh, it so happened that he had uh, such loyal followers who could also create a tradition which uh, deliberately presenting his um, as a role, role model and advertising and disseminating his ideas through writing. Uh, so if someone or this otherworldly individual with a great spiritual message to deliver uh, uh, has no followers who can perpetuate the message, then it dies out. And those followers have to secure material resources to, and institutional support. So, that's basically what it becomes uh, otherworldly mysticism because innerworldly mysticism uh, with all the consequences. The ideals eventually transform themselves into the opposite of what they were originally. Yes. Yeah, I, I, you'll be the next. Yes. Naturally, think a lot about teaching, um, and um, uh, it's it's kind of a hobby in academia these days that whenever a binary is put up, just instantly the word is problematized. You have to problematize yes. the binary. I never mentioned it. No, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm innocent. No, I, I, I'm, I'm, I, that's what I was about to say because I really appreciate the fact that you are able to work in contrasts, right? That's useful for teaching. I genuinely mean that. Gen yes. Not problematize every binary instantly, but to let the student kind of understand. Okay, there are these two uh, dynamics. Okay, so I'm I, I'm with you on that. I understand that. My question is, what what for you? What model of teaching informs your study of Sufism, right? So on the one hand, you have to kind of simplify things and reduce them down to those. But on the other hand. I know that you know that uh, there is a relationship between the Sharia and the Sufia, that yeah. they are not both totally contrasted. And some of the claims uh, that you made that uh, it's dangerous, it's controversial, um, I mean, I could, I could name many other claims. They play into this kind of New York Times narrative that Sufism is the Bay Area picture than the fundamentalist, sorry, on the other end of the state. 
statistics about the world and what they are. And so I'm just curious, I know that your mind is much more complex and sophisticated than that. I what, is the, what is the relationship between your teaching of socialism and that uh, complex register? Just take me through that process. Well, complexity exists, uh, and I would say it would be the uppermost level of esotericism. <laughs> you, I told you that uh, uh, there, there is esoteric truth. Yes, yes. yes. So, uh, first of all, you have to explain to the students that there are different types of Sufism. I think it's pretty clear. Uh, that uh, that Sufis, uh, Sufism is Islam in miniature. It has everything that Islam has. It has institutions, it has its uh, role models, uh, it has its own image of the Prophet, its own interpretation of the Quran, its own uh, institutions, bricks, uh, uh, brick and mortar institution. So it is, a, uh, your idea is that it, it's not departing from the Sharia. Uh, the Sharia is part of it, but uh, then the next stage is the uh, uh, Tariqa and then Haqiqa, the three, yes. So uh, you can compartmentalize this, uh, present it to uh, the students uh, at the second level of uh, immersion into esotericism. And at, at this third, you just say everything I, you, I, you learned is incorrect and can be problematized. Uh, so, and then I step back and examine my own positionality as a, that's a Gramscian idea, uh, as, a, as a researcher, and I say the whole, what I've just told you, it's, uh, it's a creation of my imagination in the same way as Sufis uh, like Sheikh Hisham uh, or Ibn Arabi created their own universe of meaning. They were not using all the evidence. It's just impossible, and uh, Hyde and White shows that it's, it's a trope of Sufis. It's a condensed vision of Sufi by a particular individual, uh, which, of course, uh, tends to uh, neglect. So I, I recognize that there are blind spots in my presentation and in my choice of heroes. I, uh, chose Ibn Arabi and his mystical universe, but I could have cho ha chosen Hoja Ahrar, whom I described as the, the landowner. And his modus operandi was very different from Ibn Arabi, because he wanted to influence the uh, Timurid uh, rulers of Central Asia to uh, achieve uh, greater efficiency of, and uh, greater good for the society, for the people who turn to him as the final recourse in their misery. So, yes, uh, my, uh, my answer to your question is, would be Sufism is so diverse that, uh, like Islam, uh, it contains many contradictions. Islam prohibits uh, vi visual representation of human beings and figural representation, but you have a profusion of miniatures. Islam prohibits the drinking of wine, but there is a whole a very large tradition of wine poetry, Khamriya, and so forth. So uh, human uh, uh, experience is contradictory, self-contradictory, and uh, you, you, can, you cannot bring to bear all the available evidence and create a comprehensive picture. So my vision of Sufism is just a one glimpse of Sufism from a certain angle. So whether I have chosen the right Sufis or wrong Sufis, uh, esoteric uh, tradition of Quran interpretation exists. It, it is represented by the leading uh, lights of Sufi tradition. Uh, but there are uh, opponents, even within Sufi tradition, as Suhrawardi, uh, Shihab din wrote a very very, very philological tafsir, which I, by the way, showed at the beginning. Uh, but it, it's a tafsir which, where you begin to, to fall asleep after the second uh, page because you already know what he is about to say. He will focus on the uh, uh, linguistic and stylistic differences and uh, then bring to bear certain uh, 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 verses of pre Islamic poetry to Khaled. So I chose the more controversial aspects because maybe personally. Attracted to it. Uh, yes, please. Mm -hmm. My question is Have I ruined 
my daughter and grandchildren by reading the, uh, the tales of the Mullah of Nasrudin by Idris Shah because she's now in her 40s and a professional in academia and circles and grandchildren are growing up with our Sufi library with all those tales. So now that that's in them, two generations, three generations, where do we go next? What book should I be reading so that I can share that with my daughter and she can share it with her children? I believe it comes out in October, right? <laughs> yeah, book? My, my book, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't read my book. Uh, uh, yeah, as a family, as a uh, coffee table book. It, it's uh, kind of... Uh, iconoclastic to some extent. So I wouldn't uh, want to ruin your, the u universe of meaning that your uh, family has created. Uh, because some insights may be, like, may be dis disappointing, I would say, disillusioning about Sufism. Because I try to be sober. <laughs> in that, uh, I, I like Sufism, but I'm not part of the Sufi tradition. I I'm an, an outsider looking inside. And uh, that has its own advantages and disadvantages. Blind, blind spots are present. I experienced some uh, mystical transports earlier in my life, so I know that such things exist. Um, but um, I would continue to read uh, Sayyid Hussain Nasr. Uh, that's uh, the current exponent of one um, aspect of Sufism, Not almost uh, super confessional. Uh, uh, and Mawla uh, Nasruddin, uh, he, he was uh, actually uh, a, a man for all seasons because in, in the Russian literature, he represents something completely different. He represents uh, a person who can, uh, uh, who can fool the rulers and who, it's, so if you, uh, the Russians are always trying to fool their rulers, so uh, uh, being Russian, I can tell you. Uh, and uh, he was admired, especially for, for his wit in outsmarting the oppressive rulers and uh, stupid cadis and so forth, the stupid uh, judges and so forth. So you see, even Nasruddin stands for a variety of and understood differently by different people with different baggages. But you should probably keep reading the literature produced by uh, Sufis themselves, mm -hmm. and uh, it will change, it will mutate, uh, uh, because uh, our conditions change. Uh, you, uh, yes. I wondered when Sufis produce new practices of different types, whether meditative or ritual or physical regimes, to what degree do they feel compelled to go back to the Quran and um, produce some kind of scriptural exegesis that locates those within the Quran? And if they do, what type of hermeneutical strategy do they do to accomplish that? They will adopt. Uh, that's <laughs> um, so. That speaks to the question of different Sufi groups. In we, in some Sufi groups, you are just you you don't, are not supposed to engage in your own quest. You will be just taken by, your, by the hand, by the sheikh, and led from one step of maqam to another. So you're not supposed to question anything, the sheikh says. Uh, and uh, uh, whereas your question presupposes some kind of uh, degree of freedom. So these uh, individuals would be kind of uh, the, the ones that you have in mind would probably choose a, a very liberal sheikh who simply works more or less like a shrink uh, with whom they share uh, their experiences and who says, well, that's interesting, you should try this and that, but would not really hand, hold, hold hand. Yeah. So it's different pedagogical methods and now everything is available, all, all these approaches, it's like uh, a commodization of Sufism to some extent, where when you go to a supermarket, you select certain combinations of food uh, which you prefer and put together a dish. 
So I, I don't, yeah, you will say that I, I very simplify things, but um, the, this public religion uh, is commodified, uh, marketization is, uh, so your question was, every, every Sufi uh, who is not, not non-denominational Sufi, uh, because non-denominational Sufi is Sufi who accepts uh, the Sufi tradition without converting. So this individual uh, should start with the Quran and uh, then read it as uh, uh, Bervering des describes, uh, seeking resonances. Uh, maybe even a strange word may trigger uh, a, a stream of associations that are sanctified to some extent by the sanctity of the Quranic text and may uh, result in a kind of newborn, uh, reborn uh, mentality that is described uh, in Sufi literature in detail. When just one uh, Quranic phrase uh, led to the uh, certain uh, highway robbers to repent of their ways, uh, abandon their uh, mundane pursuits and uh, then per perform a pilgrimage and so But your question was, uh, I'm, uh, well, I'll give you an example from the materials I work on, yeah. which is in a Buddhist context in the 10th century, 12th century, 13th century. You have thousands of pages of descriptions of formal practices of various types, and these then have a, a, a complex relationship back to the original scriptures. And sometimes nobody really cares. They don't try to relate them back to the original scriptures. At other times, they try to go back to the original scriptures and take something that looks fairly innocent of any description of a practice, and through fairly complex exegetical strategies, say, well, here's how this relates to this formal practice. So my question was, in denominational uh, traditions historically, did you have the development of these kinds of formal practices that got written down in the common material literature? And then, if so, did they formally try to relate that back to some passage in the Quran that they said authorizes that in some sense, or points to that? So the Quran is yeah, part of the pedag pedagogy, so reciting certain uh, favor favorite selected verses that resonate with the Sufi viewpoints, uh, with Sufi Gnosiology and Sufi cosmology. Yeah, this is uh, selective reading. But, what, uh, but Sufism in the time that you described, uh, that 9th, 10th century, uh, we, you practically find very little in the way of concrete rules. Everything was transmitted orally or embodied by the, by the sheikh. The sheikh embodied the certain vision of Sufism and uh, you were supposed to imitate him. Uh, he became a surrogate of the prophet because one of the uh, demands of this Sufi tradition, uh, of the Muslim tradition in general, is follow in the footsteps of the prophet. So uh, you had to imitate the prophet's ways to, in such meticulous detail as becoming actually uh, almost uh, entering the prophetic state of mind, which was uh, open to divine outpourings. So, uh, but uh, what is, it's fascinating that you mentioned such a uh, detailed literature. No, there is no such detailed literature in early Sufism and even in the later Sufism. They preferred to rely on oral teachings and they, uh, all they provide is the text for recitations. It, it conta it's usually Quranic texts and it's sometimes mystical poetry like Rumi and uh, Ibn al-Farid and other uh, great mystical poets or uh, praises of the, of the prophet. So the texts are provided, but how to perform, the, how to control your breath, this would appear only in the India, be, probably under the influence of yogi and others, uh, and very late. So uh, that, it's fascinating that uh, the uh, Tibetan literature, the Buddhist literature is so rich in this uh, concrete instruction that are committed to writing. That's not, not what I, the Sufism I know. It was mostly orally and uh, imitationally. Yeah. I was going to say just quickly uh, to yeah. Professor Germano's question, where is, how does hadith, right, since you're talking about the, the prophetic model as one to be emulated, how does the hadith fit in within 
Between yeah. the Quran and let's say yeah. the teachings of the Quran. Yeah. The Hadith Shaykh. described uh, the, how the Prophet behaved. So you are supposed to do everything that it did. But uh, for instance, the Prophet liked to use a toothpick, but it's not a requirement. So, but you, uh, you go an, the extra mile. You, uh, if the, he used the toothpick, you use. As a negative example, the prophet never mentioned, the, the tradition never mentions whether he ate mo watermelons. So a fundamentalist would never eat a watermelon uh, because, uh, so it's, it's a literalist approach. Of course, the Sufis would laugh. and They say it doesn't matter what, whether he ate or not. So, it's, uh, so the hadith provide the guidelines, but it's following in the footsteps of the prophet. So he is the role model because he had this transport experiences. He had visual experiences of the archangel Gabriel. Probably it was God in uh, Surah 53, not uh, Gabriel. It was a throne vision. Uh, but then you try to enter into this state of mind by following meticulously everything he did but not over-exaggerating as with the melon, yeah, uh, watermelon. So. One more question. Yeah. Uh, in light of your uh, helpful answer, a few questions ago, this, this idea that um, it's certainly the trend in modern hermeneutic theory that uh, inevitably we all interpret it in accordance with our own sort of yeah. inner worlds. And, mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm wondering, uh, in light of, of, of what you said, if you could speak more about your conclusion here. Um, of course, the exoteric um, interpreters are invested in saying, we're conservative, we don't say anything about, about, about that, and we don't say anything new, um, and, and we want to ring new Sufis in, we don't want it to be a free-for-all. Of course, the very typical Sufi response is, no, you are absolutely making the Quran in your own image, yes. and that's, that's all anybody does. So uh, I'm just wondering what, what, what you make of the, the, the Sufi response um, uh, that it, you're pretending if you're saying that that you're actually conservative, right? Um, uh, free for alls are always happening, right? Yeah. And, and we're just sort of embracing it in a way that you refuse to. Uh, Ibn Arabi would, of course, famously insist that he's actually the only true literist, literalist, right? And then everybody else is, is uh, making it up in their own. Yeah, he rejects the notion of Tawid as uh, the esoteric interpretation. He says what he does is not that. Yeah. So what do you make of that sort of Sufi response back to the, the exoteric uh, uh, my, my, my sense uh, from my research, what I've done, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm oversimplifying, oversimpl is that uh, Sufism is very hierarchical as opposed to fundamentalism. Fundamentalism, therefore, represents a sort of Protestantism. I'll talk about this. In that... Uh, uh, the hierarchy of knowers, those who know, uh, is not created uh, and rejected by, by the fundamentalists. They, they feel that the claims, truth claims of the Sufis are divisive because each, uh, it's a cacophony of claims. Everyone says, I know the truth. Uh, and uh, you should follow me. Uh, my sheikh is the best uh, in the world, and uh, he has great, greatest access to the underlying messages of the Quran. Uh, so this, this uh, creates divisions and hierarchies. And as you know, one of the m messages of uh, Protestant movement in Christianity, uh, although this is a far-fetched analogy, was the rejection of hierarchies uh, and uh, this I imaginary universes and the refocusing on uh, uh, personal relations with God. Uh, so to, to that extent, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, Ibn Abd al-Wahhab and his followers today, uh, the follow this so-called Salafis or fundamentalists, I, I, I know it's a uh, problematic term, but I, let's call it as a shortcut. Uh, they, are, they uh, recognize that the Muslim world is very divided, everything, therefore everything that divided. It's a local sh shrines, tombs, they divide. Uh, the uh, Sharia, the, uh, the uh, innovations in the local uh, practice of Islam, 
uh, makes, uh, for, lo lo localizes Islam. Everything should be transcendent. There should be unified Islam and all divisions, theological, legal, because they reject even the legal traditions because they are divisive, and Sufism as part of the divis divisory strategy uh, of the enemies of Islam. So that's, that Sufis, uh, should say, uh, would probably answer to, to, to the fundamentalists. You see only the, the surface. You are unable to uh, comprehend the uh, profusion of different universes that lie behind the, the text, if it is correctly read. And you uh, live a very poor life. You are just uh, uh, parrots who repeat certain phrases uh, um, you are like donkeys uh, who carry the books, it's a Quranic image, without knowing uh, what, are, what is in the books. So I, 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 I'm representing this imaginary Sufi re responder, but uh, I would say that uh, fundamentalism uh, reduces the very rich tradition to bare bones and to legalistic aspects. Uh, and therefore, it lacks imagination and doesn't enrich and enhance human life. Uh, whereas Sufism enhances it and in, it makes it uh, more imaginative, more creative, and uh, I think more conducive to happiness. Because uh, Al-Ghazali said, Kimiya Isad, the chemistry of, that the our goal is not to acquire knowledge. Our goal is to acquire happiness. And everything that, con that is conducive to achievement of happiness, it's an ancient Greek idea, actually, should be taken on board. If it's Sufism, so be it. Uh, but legalism deprives people of happiness. They just make them machines performing external aspects of the Sharia mechanically without uh, putting their heart and soul into it. Thank you. Uh, <laughs>